Hi, this is our video on chapter four, which is about correlations between two different data sets. So far, everything we've studied has involved data that came with just one variable, or what's called univariate data. What we're gonna look at now is if we can find correlations or some sort of relationship between two separate variables. This is called bivariate data. Um, again, the, uh, the prefix is there, uni for one, bi for two. And what we're trying to do, though, is to see if there's a connection between what we call the response variable and the explanatory variable, sometimes called the predictor variable. The way we're going to do this visually is with scatter diagrams or scatter plots. And when we do this, the explanatory variable is our horizontal axis. The explanatory is our independent variable. It's the one that we can typically control. And then the response variable is our dependent, which is on our vertical axis. Now, when we plot this, this data, and again, it's really just plotting two points and seeing if there's some sort of relationship, uh, the two that we're gonna focus on are if they show up as lines. Those are the two we're gonna focus here on stats one. If it is going up, like graph A, we say that's a positive association, and if it's going down, again, in a line, we say that's a negative association. And we wanna see, again, if our data is related in those sorts of ways. Now, there are other ways that our data could be related. We see that you could have a quadratic or some other pattern where clearly there is a pattern, clearly the data is related. It's just not necessarily a straight line. And then, of course, there's the case where there is no relation and the points are just they look like they're almost randomly scattered across the plot. Now, looking at a diagram is not good enough. Um, it's just not mathematically valid enough for us to say that there's going to be a relationship or a linear relationship. So what we need to do is calculate what's called the correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficient is always given by the variable R. And here's the formula, except we're never gonna actually calculate this formula by hand. Again, we're gonna use technology. So yeah, that's the formula, but you don't really have to worry about it because again, we're gonna let either Microsoft Excel or the TI-8384 calculate this for us. Uh, sometimes you will see other textbooks use the, the Greek letter rho for the correlation coefficient, but our book is only going to use the variable R. And anytime you see the little R, it's going to stand for that correlation coefficient. So what is this correlation coefficient? Well, we have a set of data with, again, an explanatory variable and a response variable. The, the relationship between those two will always be described by, again, this correlation coefficient R that's always going to be between negative one and positive one. If the correlation coefficient is positive one, then it's a positive linear relation, or again, the line is a perfect line going uh, up. If it's negative one, then it's a perfect line, but going down. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with the slope of the line going up or down. It's just saying that every point lies in a line. And again, the closer you are to positive one, that's the closer you are to a positive association, closer to negative one, the closer to a negative association. So again, the closer to one, the better. If R is close to zero, then there's no evidence that a linear relationship exists. It would, well, not be describable with any sort of linear model, anything that's a line. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no relationship whatsoever, because obviously there could be like a quadratic or some other pattern. This is just for lines. We couldn't describe the data using a line. So the linear co correlation coefficient is, is unitless. So again, it doesn't matter what our data is. We're going to use R and we're going to use the same values of R uh, regardless of whatever it is we're trying to compare. It doesn't matter what the units are. It doesn't matter what the data is. If we want to see if there's a linear correlation between the two, uh, we follow the same exact process, which is really nice. Also, the correlation coefficient is not resistant. Therefore, remember we talked about those outliers. If there is an outlier, it is absolutely going to affect the value for R. 
Now, here's the most important fact about this entire section. The one fact that you need to remember, hopefully for the rest of your life, and you take with you as you continue on your education, continue on with whatever you do for the rest of your life, just because there is a correlation does not mean there is a causation. All right, just because two things are related does not mean that one causes the other. And there are tons of examples of completely unrelated things that seem to be correlated. And again, that does not mean that one necessarily causes the other. Um, and again, even if we look at that correlation coefficient and it's one, that doesn't mean that one variable caused the other. And actually, in statistics, we can never, ever, ever claim causation. And that's just a good rule of thumb, too. If you ever see any study that claims that something causes something else and they use statistics, um, they obviously don't understand statistics very well. We can only show that there is a relationship between two things. Um, one of my favorite examples here is that they did a study that showed that the more people used sunscreen, the more likely they were to develop skin cancer. Well, do, do you think that using sunscreen caused skin cancer? Well, of course not. Now, there was a relationship between sunscreen and skin cancer. And again, that relationship said that the more often you use sunscreen, the more likely you were to get skin cancer. But it's not a cause and effect. There's a third variable there, which is, well, the fact that people go out in the sun. You put on sunscreen. So people who are spending more time in the sun are using more sunscreen, and they're also developing skin cancer because they're out in the sun more. There was a third variable. There was that lurking variable confounding the data. There was a third explanation for why that was. All right. Now that we talked about the correlation coefficient, we can say that things are correlated using that variable R. Well, a lot of times we also want to create a line or a linear model that's going to best fit the data or the best fit line. This uses something called the least squares regression. And again, we don't have to worry about the formula that does it because we're just going to use it with technology. We're going to let technology calculate what this line that would best fit our data is actually going to be. So let's take a look at an example. So for my Calc 2 class, I wanted to know whether there was a correlation, right, a relationship between the grade that a student got on their homework and the grade they got on their exam. And so I organized all my data into a table. So each student, we see that you know, the first student had a homework score of 23 out of 25, but their test score was a 60 out of 100. And I did that for all 21 students in my class. Now. The table's good because it's perfectly accurate, but again, typically we want to visualize what's going on. And so when I visualize the data, this is what I ended up with. And hmm, is there a relationship here? Again, it it's kind of seems that a lot of the data seems to be in kind of a line, but there's obviously points off the line that are a little bit random. Well, can I model this with a line? Is there a relationship? And the graph is a little ambiguous. I, could see it both ways. So this is where that correlation coefficient R comes in. So again, using technology, I found that the value for R was 0.62574, and I was even able to find the linear model Y equals 1.39X plus 50.58. So now I could plot that line on top of my scatter diagram, and well, there we go. That's the best fit line. What that means is that that line mathematically is closer to every single ordered pair than any other possible line we could have drawn. And again, we use technology for this. And again, it kind of matches what my intuition was for these points. Of course, we saw the points off the line. So is this really going to be a good model for showing that there's a relationship? Well, that's where that value R comes in. So we need to know our sample size n. We have to have calculated our correlation coefficient R using technology, and then we're going to use what's called the critical value table, all right, which is in appendix A2 in your book. Uh, and the nice part is if you open the e-text on my math lab, you just literally type in A2 at the top and it'll bring you right to the table, but they also include the table with most of the homework problems that require it too. And then what we want to do is compare the sample size and the correlation coefficient based on this table. 
All right, so my sample size was 21. So again, we want to find where 21 is with our sample size. And then we find what's the related correlation coefficient, what's called the critical value. Now, in this case, the critical value is 0.433, and our R value is 0.626. Since ours is bigger, if it's bigger, then check mark. There is a correlation. All right. So based on this data, there is a correlation. A student's homework score is related to that student's test score. Now, again, I can't claim causation. I can't say that doing your homework means you'll do better on your test. I mean, I suspect that that's probably true, but there could be third, you know, there could be some third factor. Maybe just better students do better on the homework and better on the tests. You know, maybe there is, you know, other factors as well. Uh, but there is definitely going to be a correlation between this data. Now, for the linear regression, when we found that linear model, and again, we use technology, it all goes back to our, uh, well, equation of a line, the slope intercept, the y equals mx plus b, where m is your slope or your rate of change, and b is your y-intercept. Now, the slope, which is your rate of change, we call that the expected rate of the response variable to one unit of the explanatory variable. And again, that's how much we would expect things to change. Um, well, as kind of a rate of change, right? Now, the y-intercept is the expected value if the explanatory variable is zero. Basically, if x equals zero, this is what we would expect for the variable y. Um, now, just a big note, the y-intercept is not necessarily always a reasonable value. Um, there's what's called just a reasonable domain. You know, for example, if you were trying to plot the, the relationship between the square footage of a house and its market value, well, clearly there's going to be a relationship there, right? The more square footage a house has, the more valuable that house is. But would it make sense to find the price of a house with zero square feet? Well, no, no such house exists. That doesn't make sense. Obviously, that linear model is not going to be valid for all time. Uh, similarly, something like life expectancy. You know, we looked at life expectancy in that last unit. It wouldn't make a ton of sense to continue that all the way back to year zero, because then you're actually going to end up with, well, negative years as your life expectancy. And you can't live to negative years old because nobody dies before they are even, you know, nobody dies years before they're even born. So it wouldn't make a ton of sense. So again, these are useful tools, but we have to understand the, um, well, the limitations inherent in them. Now, for my Calc 3 students, again, I used technology and I found that line was 1.39x plus 50.58. So what do those numbers mean? Well, the slope is 1.39. That means that for every point increased on the homework, that student could expect a 1.39 point increase on their exam. All right. The y-intercept was 50.58. That means if a student did zero homework, they could have expected to get a score of like 51 points. Now again, this regression line is probabilistic. That means we can make predictions, but it never guarantees anything. All right, just like we can only show correlation, but never ever causation, um, we can't really be sure that confounding isn't, exist, isn't occurring. And again, we, we'll see that obviously when I drew that line, not every point was on that line. And so, well, how far off is our prediction from what actually happened? Well, that's what's called the residue. The residue is basically how far off from our prediction are we? Now, again, for the, the regression line for this set of data, we want to know well, what would the score of the test be if a student got a 17 on their homework? Well, if I want to predict, I'm just going to plug in x equals 17, right? The homework was my independent variable x. The exam score was the dependent variable y. And so again, I'm just going to plug it into my line. Plug it in. I do my order of operations. So multiply the 1.39 times 17, then add the 50.58, and I get 74.21. So if a student got a 17 on the homework, we would expect a test score of approximately 74. And again, you want to round these values to whatever reasonable and just pay attention to what my stat lab is asking for. 
So again, if a student did 17, got 17 points on the homework, they could expect a test score of 74. However, if we go back to the table, there was a student who scored 17 on the homework, but their actual test score was a 68. The residue is going to be how far off the observed was from the predicted. So we take the observed, which was 68, and subtract what the line predicted. And the line predicted 74.21. So my residue is negative 6.21. And again, your residue absolutely can be negative. All right. So that covers the, the main concepts of chapter four and, and using the regression line and the correlation coefficient. I'm going to be making a separate video that shows you how to find those things on your homework using Microsoft Excel in our homework helps video.